of a little town called Cornwall, England. It was, after all, the night of the annual Christmas pageant of all things. And an especially big deal for all the children in the community, because in that little village, pretty much every child was guaranteed a part in the Christmas pageant. They got to try out for the role that they wanted to play in the story that everybody gets a part. Which leads us to the problem, because there was a little child by the name of Harold. <laughs> Harold really, really, really wanted to be in the play, too. But he was, well, a little slow. Directors were ambivalent. They knew that he wanted to be in the play, and he would be crushed if he didn't get a part, but they were afraid of what might happen to the town's magic moment. Finally, they decided to cast Harold as the innkeeper. Perfect solution, so they thought. You know, the one who turns Mary and Joseph away the night that Jesus is to be born. He had, after all, only one line to memorize and one line to deliver. I'm sorry, we have no room. You and I could remember that much, couldn't we? I'm sorry, we have no room. No one could imagine what was going to happen based on that one line. Well, after... The weeks of practice and little Harold in his room in front of the mirror saying that one line over and over again. I'm sorry, we have no room. And working with the coaches and rehearsals and all of those things that go into a Christmas pageant. The church was packed out the night that the uh, story was presented. And it unfolded according to plan. The angels were singing. Joseph was dreaming the trip to Bethlehem and all the things that went with that. Finally, Joseph arrives at the door on the set to the inn, and Joseph knocks, and Harold was there. With a little coaching, uh, he opened the door. With a little more coaching, he whispered, uh, his line when Joseph asked, do you have any room for the night? Uh, Harold mumbled his line, I'm sorry, we have no room. And with a little more coaching, closed the door. The directors heaved a sigh of relief. We got through that. Everything's smooth sailing from here. And as Mary and Joseph prepared to walk to the edge of the stage to the next Scene, suddenly the whole entire set from one end of the stage to the other began shaking and rattling and they were afraid the whole set was going to collapse. And finally the door burst open and, and Harold's little face came out and he said, but wait, wait, you can have my room. <laughs> oh, Harold knew more than he really understood. You got it. Jesus, you can have my room. You can have my heart. What will you do with the Son of God who came to earth to find you? Jesus, who traded the crown and the throne room for a stable, who traded the praise of angels for human mockery, the Creator who gave Himself on the cross, the Bible has one response, and the only appropriate response uh, that really it was summed up by Harold in his uh, understanding. But we find the appropriate response to what Jesus did for us in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. And if you have that scripture and are able to, uh, please stand in honor of the reading of God's word tonight. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Gracious, wonderful, heavenly Father, Lord 
Jesus Christ, precious Spirit of God, that you would give yourself for one such as I, defies description. Thank you, come and indeed live in our hearts. We have been crucified with Christ, and you live in us. There is no good in us except what is of Christ in your presence in our life. Help us to live by faith each and every step of the way. Receive us as we commit ourselves into your presence tonight. Speak to our hearts. Encourage, inspire, equip, and help us for the living of these days to glorify you in everything that we say, think, and do. And we honor you uh, in this time of worship. Come and lead us in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you so much. Been crucified with Christ. You know, this passage of Scripture means so much to me personally because it was one of those early passages of Scripture that God really uh, placed on my heart, helped me to see and understand, and helped me to put into practice, enough to visualize myself in this and uh, in different circumstances in life to understand that uh, I'm united with Christ. And that makes a difference. The world will mock that. They will mock you and me for our belief. But our understanding is that we're in Christ and that we are children of the King. That we belong to uh, Christ because of His choice and what He did and what He's provided. Both at the cross and through our individual decision to receive Him, what He has done. We were separated from God, but He uh, did not want that to remain the case. And so Jesus died on the cross. Jesus justly paid my sin debt and yours and conquered sin itself. He conquered uh, the problem of sin. He conquered the penalty of sin. He conquered the power of sin. He conquered the propagation of sin. He, he conquered the pain of sin and even the practice of sin. He defeated everything that there is about sin at the cross. Not to say that for this time, while we still wait for the completion to uh, come about when Jesus will come and, as we said this morning, receive the bride unto himself, and that we will go uh, with him and be made righteous and return to live for a thousand years on this earth, as we were intended to have always lived, uh, nevertheless... The victory that Jesus brought is very real. And he gives that victory over these things to us. We, we can be free from all of those things as we live by faith for the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Notice those last two words. Very personal words to you tonight. He gave himself for you. Mm -hmm. Because of the cross, victory can be ours. We can trust in what Jesus accomplished at the cross and what was validated by the resurrection. I have been crucified with Christ. There's something about it when we receive Christ as Savior that his death and our need are combined in such a way that we're said to have died with Him, to have been crucified with Him. And, and I no longer live. That the, the old life and, and all that stood uh, uh, to separate me from God has, has been done away with. I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live. In the Valley of Vision, a Puritan devotional book or writing uh, there is this statement. It says, Show me the enormity of my guilt by the crown of your thorns, uh, the pierced hands and feet, the bruised body, the dying cries. Infinite must be the evil and guilt that demands such a price. The Son of God would die. Yet thy heart hastens to my rescue. That means it hurried to my rescue. Thy love endured my curse. It was God's choice to do this. 
uh, thy mercy bore my deserved stripes. Live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And by dying to self, I no longer live, but I can live for Christ. To count ourselves as crucified with Christ, dying to the old way, dying to sin. In Romans chapter 6, Paul talks about this you know, sin and the Christian and, and the relationship that we have. He says, shall we you know, continue in sin so that grace may increase? By no means. After all, we died to sin. We, we're separated from that. We're, we're no longer living that way. And, and it would have been great if he had uh, also used this phrase uh, uh, that we see in, in verse 20 here in chapter 6. It would have helped us to understand what he's talking about in 6, I think, so well. But by looking at the two passages together, we understand that it, it is uh, uh, the fact that in Christ... We've been crucified with Him. We're counted as having died with Him. And therefore, the effect of what He accomplished has been applied to us. We stand justified right with God because of what He did. And because He not only died but rose again. Uh, when God looks at us and He sees us in Christ, He sees us as a new creation. A new creation. The old having gone, the new having Come and there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We learn that victory in our life and, and we begin to practice that victory in our life and we overcome the uh, consequences of an evil world. And like when we regard ourselves as crucified with Christ, no longer lives, He lives in us. Him living His life through us. And we live what we live by. Faith. No longer my kingdom. No longer my agenda. No longer my preferences, but His. And we find out that Jesus, who lived a perfect life, who lived a perfectly obedient life, who lived a perfectly successful life, when we follow His ways, we start to experience those things in our own life as well. This life I live in the body, the life here and now, while the first part of verse 20 might be very theological, the second part is very practical. How do you live that kind of victory? How do you share in that? Well, the first part is the theological, but the change of mindset and how we view ourselves, how we understand ourselves. But then also actually putting into practice the life that we live by faith in Him who died for us. The life here and now, he is saying, this isn't something idealistic. This isn't something out there somewhere or some kind of thing just floating around in the clouds. It's very real. What happened in the past, our salvation, has a continuing implication. I died to the old way of life. That's no longer me. That's no longer what I'm living for or uh, what I'm striving for but rather following Christ. It's as if Paul says, listen, my old life, my old goals, my old plans, my old relationships were nailed to the cross no longer anymore. Now I have a new life because Christ came in. And the empty spaces that all of those old pursuits could never fill, that all of those old pursuits would only come up to being something empty, or something meaningless in the end. All of those old pursuits no, no longer uh, are a part because they could never satisfy anyway. But now, all those empty spaces are filled by one who does satisfy. Even in the small things of life, the daily things of life. We live a real life, in a real world, facing real challenges. Facing the enemy of the flesh and of the devil and of the world. But nevertheless, we have uh, a victory in store for us because I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live. The life I do live, I live by faith in the Son of God. And because He is in me, greater is the one who is in me than the one who is in the world. 
And so all of the enemies and all of the battles and all of the things that I face, we know there's victory. Because the battle does not belong to us. The battle belongs to the Lord. And it's already been fought and it's already been won at the cross. And I follow Him every day by faith. Since Christ lives in me, I'm able to overcome. I'm also able to endure. God can remove any obstacle, any burden, any temptation, any problem. Or, if not removing, He can deliver me through those things. That's what Paul learned and referred to as grace that is sufficient for us. And you remember, it came out of a... Uh, a very difficult experience in Paul's life. When he had, refers to it as a messenger of Satan, refers to it as a thorn in the flesh, something that was a constant impediment to his personal life and his ministry, that was a burden for him to bear, and he prayed about it. Appropriate response, as we said last week, I prayed until he got a response, and Jesus says, my grace is sufficient for you. Reminds us that in our struggles, God will sometimes remove those burdens, or other times, he will empower us to go through them, but either way, he will see to it. If we will follow him, that we experience that overcoming victory and endurance for him. His grace is sufficient. Since Christ lives in me, the life I live in the body, that is this physical life with all of its limitations and battles and struggles and burdens and uncertainties, I live by faith in the Son of God. A faith that says I know that he knows what he's doing. Even if some days I don't see the answers. I don't see the results. I don't see the things that I want to see. I trust that he has it all in his hands. And that nothing can take it out of his hands. That no scheme of man can undo what God has said will be. By faith, I live in that confidence Every day. Sometimes uh, we look for uh, those things to rescue us, and we uh, people may be uh, tempted to put their faith in the wrong things. Here, there is faith in a Savior, the Son of God, who loved me. Remember that uh, the Bible says there is no greater love than to be loved by Christ, and no greater love than what Jesus did for us. Greater love hath no man than this, that he that lay down his life for his friends. But not just simply a death, but the death that conquers those things that stood against us. And a life that was not only uh, put down, but also taken up again. He bore my sin, he died my death, and he rose in victory over all of those things and called me to belong to himself. And so, as Paul said, I want to know Jesus. And I want to know the power of his resurrection. I want to know him more and more and better and better in my life because he came to rescue me. He did this. He gave himself for me. It is the Lord who did these things. Hannah Goff was a young lady who was born in Australia. She was born to uh, parents. Her father was an alcoholic. And she watched him die a very miserable death because of his alcoholism and perhaps other things as well. She had before that watched uh, a successive loss take place in the life of their family. The loss of a beautiful home, uh, of him losing a job, and, and all of the things that that meant for the family. And she grew up with that. 
uh, memory, but she loved her father very much. And so later, as an actress and also as an author, she took her father's first name, Travers, to be her last name, and she was known as P.L. Travers. She penned a work about her life, which actually was a, a story um, about her growing up and, and the way she had hoped things would have worked out. The story was so personal to her that when Walt Disney approached her in 1941 with an offer, a generous offer, to buy the rights to the book, she refused him. And she did that every year for 20 years. <laughs> not too many people would have turned down Walt Disney back in those days. And I mean not the company, I mean the person uh, uh, himself. Finally, he figured something out. The story that she'd written, called Mary Poppins, was actually a story about herself and about how someone would come and rescue her father and save him from what happened because of his sinful life. It is a picture of what God has done for us. The author himself, who came to rescue us from ourselves, and so the movie Saving Mr. Banks was a story about the life of P.L. Travers, also known as Hannah Goff. But it's a story that reminds us of what Jesus did for us. The Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me Amen. to save me. Don't leave Jesus on the outside. Let him be your all in all. Say to him, Lord, you can have my room. You can have my whole life. Because I know you know what you're doing with it. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you.